Welcome everybody. Uh, today's session is um, the second webinar in this series on gentrification and displacement, uh, monitoring neighborhood change using data to track and prevent displacement. Um, my name is Diana Toledo. I am with River Network and I am joined by my colleague Renee, um, Renee Mazarek. And we are coordinating um, coordinators of the Urban Waters Learning Network alongside our colleagues at Groundwork USA, which is the host for this webinar. So just a little bit about, um, about the Urban Waters Learning Network. If you're not familiar, and this is the first session that you join of the River, uh, River Network uh, and the Learning Network, we are a peer-to-peer -peer network of people and entities that are working both to restore and revitalize urban waterways and to revitalize the communities around them. And so um, the Urban Waters Learning Network is um, funded with support from EPA, and this webinar is also brought to you with support from the Kresge Foundation. So um, I want to just speak a little bit. If you're not familiar with the Urban Waters Learning Network and want to learn more, we'll have our emails um, and a web webpage uh, before the end of today's session. But just by way of introduction, um, this is the second webinar in our series. We have a recording up of the first one, which was an introduction to displacement and gentrification. And so this is part of a larger uh, series. Um, we'll have a third session coming up at the end of July. I'll provide more information on that shortly. But this is a part of an effort to dig a little bit more deeply into this topic of gentrification and displacement. And um, if it seems a little bit uh, incongruous for urban water organizations to get involved in these issues, um, it's because many groups within the learning network, and I know there's some folks here who are outside of that network, are uh, working in communities that are really experiencing some very rapid changes in demographics. And so for many organizations doing work to revitalize urban waters, the question that is coming up for us is to what extent are our efforts to revitalize these waterways contributing to these neighborhoods that we're seeing, um, these changes that we're seeing in the neighborhoods. And as we advocate for you know, green infrastructure or greenways, open space, park amenities, all of the things that we want to bring to our uh, urban centers. Is there anything that we can do at the same time to help make sure that the community members we're working to support are also able to stay in those neighborhoods so we don't drive displacement private pressures? So this is the second series, the second webinar in the series, and today we're going to dig a little bit more uh, deeply into how. Uh, data is being used to both understand how neighborhoods are changing to identify areas in our communities that are uh, susceptible and vulnerable to change and uh, hear from a couple of specific places where, um, where they're really working hard to monitor those changes with hopes of, uh, of kind of uh, interrupting some of those pressures. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Renee, my colleague, so she can introduce today's presenters. Renee? Great. Thanks, Diana. Um, we're really grateful to have these presenters here with us today. Um, I'll just give you a little information about each of them. Um, Michael Cohen is a research analyst in the Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy Center at the Urban In Institute. His work focuses on affordable housing, neighborhood initiatives, and community development. He is a co-author on the recently published guide by the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership, Guide to Measuring Neighborhood Change to Understand and Prevent Displacement. And he is also a co-author on the most recent Urban Institute report about the 11th Street Bridge Park. Sarah Duda is the Deputy Director of the Institute for Housing Studies at DePaul University where she ensures that the research addresses Chicago's evolving challenges around access to affordable housing, equitable investment, and neighborhood stability. Sarah was one of the primary authors on a report by the Institute, measuring the impact of the 606, understanding how a large public investment impacted the surrounding housing market. market. Samala Dibi is a research analyst in the Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy Center at the Urban Institute where she studies interactions between community level constituents and the institutions that shape the spaces they inhabit. She supports research on urban development, community engagement, race equity, disaster resilience, and nonprofit capacity building 
primarily in Washington, D.C. She is a co-author for two of the reports um, by the Urban Institute about the 11th Street Bridge Park Equitable Development Plan. Um, so Michael is going to start us off with an overview of our topic, highlighting the importance of using data to monitor and prevent displacement. Um, and the following speakers will give more specific case studies about tools and assessments in Chicago and Washington. Um, bef before we do that, though, uh, Deanna and I wanted to get a sense for who we have in the room with us today. And so um, Deanna is going to pull up a couple of polls for you to take to, so we can get a little bit more information. So please um, take, a, take a moment to go ahead and answer. The first question is about the type of organization that you work for. Good, and we're getting some of these answers coming in. Right, it looks like, well, it's, it's still shifting a little bit, so we'll wait just another moment to, so that everybody can have a chance to weigh in. Good. Great. And so it looks like um, about 50%, 7% is nonprofit. So more than half of you from the nonprofit sector, but a lot of you are also from government. Um, and so we have another um, poll that we want to share with you as well to get a feel for um, gentrification and displacement pressures in your community. So Deanna's gonna pull that one up now. Please take a moment to Go ahead and answer this question. All right, some of the answers are coming in. And this one's a little bit more widely distributed. See, we'll take another moment to make sure everybody gets a chance. Um, but it looks like uh, the highest percentage, 35%, is the, the train has left the station where there's a lot of people who feel as though gentrification and displacement is a, um, a big influence in their community um, with 32% varying degrees across the community. Great, well, thank you. And this is important information and especially important um, as we hand this over to Michael to understand how data can give us a much clearer picture of, of this issue in our own communities. So Michael, uh, whenever you're ready, we'll hand it over. And I guess I'd like to also remind people to go ahead and, and put questions in throughout the webinar. We will um, address those at different times throughout the webinar. So. Um, please start putting your questions in that question box. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Renee. Um, and so again, I'm Michael Cohen from the Urban Institute. And so I'm going to be talking to you all a little bit about uh, the Turning the Corner project. Um, but I was sort of asked to kick us off with a little bit of framing about, you know, why, why do this? Why monitor uh, neighborhood change? Uh, why ask some of the questions that we'll talk about today. Um, and uh, so before I get into some of the more specific reasons, I want to start off with a little bit of a story. Um, so uh, as was mentioned in the bio, I do a lot of work uh, in DC around affordable housing, which often brings me into uh, contact with a lot of housing organizers. And so I remember this, this point in time in which I was speaking to this organizer about the work that we were doing around measuring neighborhood change, you know, and they kind of stopped me and said, I can tell you right now which neighborhoods in DC are gentrifying um, without, without going through this process that you're talking about. And, you know, they sort of had this question of why, why do all of this work if I can you know, from my lived experience, from talking to people, can tell you where this is happening. And so I, I think about that a lot uh, when doing this work. I was a younger uh, researcher then, so I didn't have as great of an answer. So hopefully I can do a little bit better job of convincing you all today. Um, and so the first thing is that, you know, 
data and research doesn't have to be a, a top-down process. Um, one of the key ways that we think about data is that it should be in the hands of, of residents who can leverage it to have a voice in decision-making. Um, so really using data not to overbear the stories and lived experiences of folks on the ground, but really to uplift it um, and to provide a basis for to help them communicate that uh, to decision makers and to help them uh, strengthen their ability to advocate um, to respond to some of these changes that they see happening. Um, another reason why you might do so that was beautifully illustrated in the poll that we just did is this idea that displacement risk isn't the same everywhere. If you go back to the to that story with the housing organizer, um, you know, they were thinking particularly about uh, displacement as long term, longer term, uh, primarily black residents, lower income being pushed out of their neighborhoods. But the story of that happening in East DC is totally different than how it may be happening in the northern part of DC. And it's definitely different between uh, Washington DC and say Detroit. And so data can help us understand the specifics of what's happening on the ground in terms of neighborhood change or displacement. Um, it can help us uh, have more accurate understandings of is the housing market heating up and so people are being displaced by rising rents or is it um, folks being uh, experiencing cultural displacement um, from changes in businesses. Uh, so having better data can help us really understand the nuance of what's happening on the ground, which can lead us to better responses. And then finally, what I think might be of particular interest to this group is that uh, large scale investments can increase some of these displacement pressures that we see happening. Um, so things like infrastructure inv investments or public works or transit, or, you know, I don't know, uh, redevelopment along urban waterfronts uh, might actually increase some of the housing market pressures that residents are facing. And so that means that responsible development really should seek to try to understand the effects of new projects, um, particularly the effects for longer term residents who might be more economically vulnerable. Um, and so that's, that's my case for why we should be doing this work. Um, if I haven't convinced you, I'm sure my uh, much smarter co-presenters will do so. Um, so at this point, I'm going to shift a little bit to talking about the Turning the Corner project. Um, and so the project was guided by uh, Urban Institute's National Neighborhood Indicators Project or Partnership uh, and the Federal Reserve Philanthropy Initiative which is a collaboration between the Restoring Prosperity and Older Industrial Cities Working Group of the Funders Network for Smart Growth and Livable Communities, which is in fact a mouthful, uh, and several Federal Reserve District Banks. Uh, and it was funded by the Kresge Foundation. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership, just because I think if you're looking to, to do any of this work or start to monitor neighborhood change in your area, that um, and NIT is really uh, uh, the primary place where you should start. Um, so it's coordinated by the Urban Institute, which also houses the DC partner, Greater Urban DC. Um, and it's a partnership of independent organizations in more than 30 cities that share a mission to help community stakeholders use na neighborhood level data for better decision making, uh, which is focused on advancing equity in their communities. And so the Turning the Corner project um, came out of this partnership. Uh, the project itself was launched in 2016 um, with a goal of piloting a research to action model of monitoring neighborhood change and preventing displacement with a focus on local advocacy and decision making. It was really important to this project to connect this data work to resident experiences and then connect that to actual advocacy and decision makers. Um, we also wanted to, and you'll see this in the cities um, that we worked with, we wanted to shed some insights on displacement risk and some of the areas that aren't talked about as much in the conversation around gentrification. So recovering uh, housing markets, moderately strong housing markets, um, places that aren't we don't think of as these sort of hot market areas. And then we also really wanted to document the effects on longer term residents, um, thinking of 
uh, displacement broadly as including cultural displacement, commercial displacement, as well as actual displacement of residents. Um, and so as you can see from this uh, super crowded side, slide, there are quite a few partners, a uh, ton of people to thank. Um, I won't go through them all, but I will draw your attention to the cities um, that we worked with. So Buffalo, Detroit, Milwaukee, Phoenix, and the Twin Cities. Um, and so again, we were focusing on these smaller market recovering areas um, to sort of highlight how neighborhood change and displacement might look different in some of these places. And so we asked each local team to conduct quantitative research as well as qualitative research. So pairing the numbers, the hard data with focus groups and interviews with both residents, um, stakeholders and business owners. And each city chose uh, two to four neighborhoods. Um, most of the neighborhoods that were chosen were, are, were in the early stages of uh, change of revitalization. Um, the neighborhoods were pretty diverse. Uh, Eleven of them were predominantly people of color. Um, and for nine of them, uh, more than half of the households had incomes of uh, 35000 or less, so we're talking about generally lower income uh, neighborhoods. And so if you want more detail on that, you can definitely check out our project description um, that is on the landing page that I'm sure will be sent up. And so at this point, I want to talk a little bit about some of the key themes that we saw uh, coming out of the site. And so one of the really interesting things that we saw um, folks across cities talking about in a really interesting way was this idea of community safety. Um, and so people were talking about it not in the way that folks often talk about gentrification, meaning that places are, are more safe. Um, folks had a really nuanced idea of what safety might mean um, as neighborhoods changed. So in some neighborhoods, uh, there was this perception that uh, the changes that were occurring, new, uh, new nightlife, new businesses, were actually drawing uh, different types of crime into the neighborhood, perceived to be driven by folks from outside of the neighborhood. So in, bo in both uh, Detroit and Milwaukee, residents sort of associated new uh, property crime, things like theft, uh, with some of this new development. Um, and they really saw this as something coming in from outside of the neighborhood. Uh, folks also expressed concern about how changing neighborhoods also changed norms around policing and around calling the police. Um, so in Buffalo, uh, a new medical center uh, is being built uh, in the city and folks around the, around the new center expressed concern with changes that they were seeing around uh, policing with uh, how the police were stopping uh, some of the younger residents um, and some of the norms changing around uh, what might constitute a reason to call the police. Uh, and another really interesting thing we heard was how expansively residents were thinking of the concept of safety. Um, so folks referenced a lot of this idea of as the neighborhood changes, they're losing social connections that actually made them more safe. So there are even instances of residents saying that, you know, even as crime was going down, they felt less safe because they felt less connected uh, to their neighborhood. Um, and for instance, folks in Detroit, some of the Latinx residents mentioned feeling increasingly unsafe uh, because of fear of increased police interactions because they, they felt less connected to the neighborhood, to their neighbors. They felt like they knew fewer folks and felt less, less protected. Um, and so some of the recommendations we had around community safety or for folks who are thinking about neighborhood change and its effect on, on neighborhood safety uh, was really to expand the definition of what that means. Um, so thinking beyond just crime rates or changes in crime rates to understanding the, the ways in which the connections between residents are changing. Um, and also to, again, you know, contextualize whatever data you use. And this, this is a blanket statement from community safety to housing, um, market changes, 
to economics, you need to contextualize your data with resident insights and neighborhood history. Um, so looking at these changes outside of the, the history of neighborhoods, especially in places um, that may have long histories with racism, with segregation, with redlining, um, any data that you present needs to be contextualized with some of that history. And then finally, be proactive. Uh, don't wait until you're in the midst of a project to start thinking about the effects it might be having on the neighborhoods around it. Um, you should really be envisioning how uh, a project you are engaging in might affect uh, the neighborhood and the residents, particularly uh, some of the more vulnerable residents. Um, and then another key theme that came up for us was this idea of uh, neighborhood change creating both risks and opportunities for small businesses. Um, and so we really, as I mentioned at the start, uh, have focused on small local businesses because it's uh, their important economic and social roles that they play in neighborhoods, and they're often not really talked about um, within the context of displacement. Um, and so in several sites, uh, partners talk to some of these longer term small business owners to learn what their uh, experiences uh, were like. Um, and so one of the things that we heard was that rising rents and loss of clientele can threaten longer term small businesses. So as neighborhoods change, as new investments come in, um, and as you know, longer term residents are displaced, smaller businesses might uh, face a loss of some of their clientele. And particularly businesses that are renting their spaces rather than owning uh, face uh, increased threat by rising uh, costs associated with uh, building. Um, and so our Milwaukee par partner heard this concern um, from businesses in the Walker's Point neighborhood um, that businesses were, were facing potential displacement by some of these increasing rents. Um, at the same time, we also heard that these new investments can actually create opportunities for some of the longer term small businesses. Um, so as new residents come in, as new life uh, is breathed into uh, a neighborhood, there really are opportunities for small businesses at, that require you know, support from both communities and governments to actually help them take advantage of some of these new opportunities. Um, so in Milwaukee, some of the folks that we spoke to indicated that, um, that there are actually more opportunities for longer term businesses um, because of some of this investment that was flowing into the neighborhood. Um, but then finally, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, new businesses might actually contribute to some of this, I this idea of cultural displacement. So new businesses might not be focusing on same of some of the services that are needed by longer term residents. So uh, business owners in Milwaukee and residents in Detroit brought up this idea that new businesses were really focusing on clientele from outside of the neighborhood. And one person brought up this idea that there's a huge disconnect between what the community wants and what they're actually getting. So some of the recommendations we had around small business were to ensure equitable access to resources and support for small business businesses. Um, so this was is really around the idea of equitable access to both city and philanthropic resources um, as uh, new projects are coming in, as new infrastructure investments are coming in, to really ensure that there's equitable access, that um, resources are available in multiple languages, um, and really addressing some of these barriers that might keep out uh, longer term businesses from taking advantage of some of these new investments. Um, another important uh, thing to keep in mind is really developing accurate data on small businesses. So. Um, our partner in Phoenix had this really interesting experience where they created a Google Street View survey to track small businesses um, to supplement uh, a government data source. And they actually found that in some areas using this Google Street View survey uh, more than doubled the number of businesses uh, because the government data source didn't, wasn't capturing uh, businesses with fewer than four employees. 
So really actually developing, thinking about ways to create accurate, more accurate data um, can really help reach some of these smaller businesses that might otherwise uh, fall through the cracks. And then finally, again, I hope this gets hit throughout this conversation is really leveraging resident voices um, as a way to influence some of this development. Um, so people should really be engaging residents across their um, across the cycle of their projects or um, continuously engaging residents around what do they see happening, um, where does it align or not align with the data, and how can those voices be incorporated uh, into organizing around development or zoning adjustments or land trades, any of those things where uh, resident voices can really be be leveraged. Um, and so finally, uh, I'm going to leave you with some resources because I know this can be uh, kind of a daunting process, especially if you're not particularly familiar with um, data. Um, so we developed a guide to measuring neighborhood change, um, which is really a grounding for what the process should look like. Um, example uh, variables that you might want to look at and then why those things matter. Um, so that's a really helpful starting place. Um, we also developed a qualitative toolkit. If you're interested in um, doing some of the interview process, uh, there are protocols that we've created that are uh, publicly available. And finally, there's a literature catalog that, create, that uh, captures some of the really interesting work that's being done in this area, has examples from practice as well as example methodologies that you can use. Um, and with that, uh, I will end my presentation and then pass it along to uh, Sarah. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, I do wanna speak for the value of those links that Michael just shared, which you will also receive in a follow-up email uh, probably tomorrow. Um, that will include a link to the evaluation form and all, all of these links that, that are being shared through the slides. There's a lot of information there about even how to run a, um, a uh, focus group or survey examples, et cetera, that could be super helpful. So I'm gonna turn it to um, Sarah now, but I, do, I don't think I see any questions. I just, I do wanna encourage everybody to go ahead and, and use that question box to uh, pose your questions and we'll um, we'll ask them after. Um, let me go ahead as Sarah gets started. There is one question here. Um, can you see that, Renee? Oh, yes. I'm curious who the audience was that you designed and created the toolkit for. Who is that written for, Michael? Oh, so the toolkit, the protocols are uh, written for folks wanting to collect, uh, 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 I believe it's directed at uh, business owners. So it's a protocol that folks can use to uh, collect information or collect uh, responses or thoughts from um, business owners. But let me, I can double check on that and I'll, I'll make sure I can do the uh, an accurate answer in a second. And I will say that the Turning the Corner webpage has a lot of tools that I think would be helpful for nonprofits too, wanting to explore within their own neighborhood how they see neighborhoods. How they see neighborhoods. Okay, let's, um, we'll come back, Michael, if you have more to, to answer um, to that. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, turn it to Sarah while I, um, yeah, Sarah, I think your screen is being shared if you want to take it away and share about um, Chicago's experience with displacement pressure. Great. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, and thanks, Michael, for that great introduction and overview into the importance of data and, and on the Turning in the Corner project. Um, I'm Sarah Duda. I'm the Deputy Director of the Institute for Housing Studies. Just some background in IHS, we're an applied research center based at Chicago, uh, in Chicago at DePaul University. And our mission is to create research and, and data tools uh, to help inform housing uh, and community development policy and practice. We're also the Chicago and an IT partner. Um, so my presentation today is gonna focus on um, some of the work that we did looking at how uh, the 606, which is Chicago's Rails to Trails, Elevated Rails to Trails, Trails project on the, on the northwest side of the city, uh, led to some changing market dynamics in the neighborhood. 
Um, I'm going to talk a bit about what we learned about the ways in which the housing market responded or, or didn't respond and how those um, patterns and, and, and trends have some important implications for ongoing policy and practice as we think about preserving affordability around future public investments and also how we at IHS are trying to uh, leverage that knowledge from that project to create new data tools to help inform some proactive policies to helpfully, hopefully inform uh, more inclusive development. So I know that the first webinar in this series focused on some of the pathways for displacement and gentrification, so I'm not going to really talk much about that. Um, but I think what's really important is the fact that studying uh, displacement and gentrification is notoriously difficult. And generally, once we're able to measure it, that it's, it's already happened and our, and our opportunities to intervene have largely passed. So at the Institute, we really tried to um, think in most of our most recent work about creating a, a leading indicator uh, for displacement and gentrification risk. So I'll be talking about that um, a little bit later. But generally, what we know from the research is that certain types of investments uh, can lead to increased costs in neighborhoods. Um, and that can lead in, particularly on rents and on house prices. Um, and that has to do with that they attract new demand for housing um, and that that can have implications in particular um, for levels of affordability in the neighborhood. Um, we also know that certain types of households and populations are more vulnerable to displacement when costs go up. And these are renters, seniors, low-income households, large households, cost burden households. We know that there are greater risk for displacement in a rising cost environment. So back in 2015, um, we were engaged by a group of community organizations that were in Logan Square and Humboldt Park and Hamosa um, in the neighborhood around the 606. And they asked us to really study how the 606 had changed the market. Um, and in particular, what those implications would be for affordability. The 606 opened um, in uh, early 2016. So because, again, this is, this is a study that back then um, was, we were trying to do at the same time that, that this development had just really opened. So trying to find in the data, um, socioeconomic data, demographic data about changes is just not possible. So we really focused on housing market changes, which are much more dynamic and we were able to leverage a data resource that we've cultivated over time to look at how house prices have changed. So in order to do that, we created a house price index uh, to study changes in the neighborhoods adjacent to the 606 trail, so we focused on price. And so examining some preliminary data, and this is also backed up by um, our, the experience of community partners that we work with locally, that, these are, that the 606 could span really different neighborhoods. Um, this is looking at the parcel level map of a half mile radius of the 606. The 606 is that green line there. And really we found that there was a lot of differences uh, east of Western Avenue versus west of Western Avenue. This is looking at this parcel composition of the housing stock. And you can see just without even <laughs> knowing what we're looking at that uh, west of Western is a lot more blue and east of Western is a lot more orange and yellow. And, that orange and yellow refers to uh, single-family homes and, and condominiums. And 606 West is much more rental. All that blue are, are rental, and a lot of that is light blue. And those are two to four unit buildings, which um, if you're a houser, you'll know that two to fours are across the country a really critical part of our naturally occurring affordable housing stock. So this is not subsidized housing. This is just naturally occurring affordable housing by virtue of its structure, who tends to own it, mom and pop, uh, and, that, and owners, um, because of its small size and its age, tends to be much more affordable than other types of rental housing. And it also tends to serve mostly low and moderate income people. So it's a really important, critical part of the housing stock. So these are, neighborhoods, just in terms of stock, look really different. And they also look really different from a socioeconomic demographic and housing market perspective. So 606 West is substantially lower income. It's higher poverty, has more renters, higher cost burden. It's predominantly Latino, um, which is important from an equity perspective. It has larger family sizes, um, and it's a lot more distressed from a foreclosure distress perspective. A lot, had a lot more investor activity, too, um, in, in the most recent uh, housing market downturn. 
So if you remember from a few slides earlier, these are the very same populations, but from a vulnerability to displacement in, um, in lost affordability environments, but these are the very same households and population types that we're, we are most concerned with. So when we decided to study the 606 and we segmented the market by wonder, wondering how house prices change in 606 West compared to 606 East. So how did house prices change? They changed pretty dramatically. So this is looking, this is our index that we created. It's a hedonic index for single family homes. We're measuring house price changes from 1997 through the first quarter of 2016, which is when we released the study. You can see that second quarter 2012 is when the funding was secured for the project. Uh, third quarter of 2013 is the groundbreaking and the, and the trail opened in the second quarter of 2015. So a couple of takeaways. Um, so the dark line, by the way, is 606 West. Light line, lighter blue line is 606 East. 606 West, much more from a price perspective, um, volatile. Um, you see a lot of run up to, there's a housing boom there, right? Um, it looks a lot actually like just generally Chicago's house price trend. So you get the boom, the bust, and some recovery of the market. 606 East is a very much more stable line. And that, that's indicative of a really strong and stable market. Prices never really had a boom. They never really busted. And they just sort of steadily appreciated over time. So since groundbreaking, we noticed that these two neighborhoods had pretty um, big increases in house prices, but they were different. Um, 606 West appreciated very differently than 606 East. So, um, for example, in 606 West, house prices increased by nearly 50% after groundbreaking, compared to 606 East, where house prices increased about 13 point, exactly rather, 13.8%. So, the question then is, to what degree does this have to do with just the general market, right? 2012, bottom of the market. To what degree is this just the general recovery? So in order to understand to the, the really relationship to the development of the 606, we increased, we in, in, added on um, a geospatial element to the analysis um, to understand to what degree were buyers paying a premium to live within certain distances of the trail. So was there a premium in the 606? There was. Um, but critically, from a policy perspective, it was really just in, in 606 West that we detected the premium. So we found that within a fifth of a mile of the trail, there was a really significant premium of about 22%, um, and that that premium dissipated um, as you got further away and disappeared at about three-fifths of a mile. Only were we able to detect this premium in 606 West, so the lower income much more vulnerable uh, side of the trail, higher renters, higher cost burden. The, the, the really the, the place where we were most concerned, where we saw house prices increase, is where they did, and it was related to the development of the trail. And 606 East, house prices uh, strong, stable, lots of amenities in the market, higher cost. The addition of this large-scale public investment didn't make a real big impact on house prices. Didn't influence decision making in terms of the, in terms of purchasing. Um, to the degree that it really was reflected in price, because this area is already amenity rich. Um, so that 22.3% premium translates in 606 West to $100,000 on top of the average sale price in 2015, um, which is pretty significant. So this research has implications for um, policy and practice. And the first is that neighborhood characteristics matter. So the market and the already really high cost portions of the trail system really didn't react in the same way as the more affordable and more vulnerable portions of the trail. Uh, secondly, the timing and interventions is important to their success, right? So we saw that house prices increased substantially shortly after the funding was secured. And this is important because if we're trying to preserve housing market affordability, really our most robust strategies as practitioners um, are less effective once costs are high. Third, uh, proximity is important. So we detected um, that, the, that the impact of the amenity was really greatest, closest to the trail, and that that dissipated the farther away you got, which suggests that really targeted interventions could be successful. And finally, that really policy incentives have to be grounded in market realities. Um, most of the incentives that I'm really aware of uh, would be dwarfed in comparison or in the face of rather a $100,000 
uh, premium that a buyer would be willing to pay to live close to 606. So essentially what we learned is that if we're going to prioritize inclusive and equitable development um, around planned investment, if we want to really fully realize all of the goals that are usually associated with, associated with these investments in terms of benefiting existing residents, then we need to be proactive about preserving affordability in order to really realize those goals. So uh, that was a really a lagging <laughs> indicator, right? We were studying what had happened. And a lot of our most recent work has really been trying to create a leading indicator to help facilitate the more inclusive and equitable, equitable development through proactive policymaking um, that really is trying to preserve affordable housing. So the way we've done that is tr to try to create a framework to understand where in the city of Chicago do we have this intersection of resident vulnerability to displacement um, so those are all those factors that we were thinking about before in terms of concentrations of populations and households that are low income, uh, cost burdened, uh, renters, et cetera. And then where do we have housing market conditions associated with changing levels of affordability? So this, uh, I'm going to lead you through a little bit of the development of this tool and then talk about how we've used it. So this is the first layer of that analysis. And we started out by saying, where can we find uh, this sort of clusters of vulnerability? Um, so we layered a many, many, many different um, variables, about 40 different variables, to try to, uh, in a, into a clustering model, to be able to try to pull out these concentrations of these vulnerable populations and households. And the areas that came up as sort of vulnerable in terms of typology are the red areas, if you know Chicago along the lakefront, the orange and, uh, and, and yellow groups of census tracts. And so these, again, are places where we have those high concentrations of, of resident vulnerability. And because a critical element of really this di displacement pressure in this particular context is associated with rising costs, we separately uh, created a geospatial analysis of parcel level sales data for one to four unit buildings to look for census tracts where we had um, uh, to, to really create a typology, rather, of census tracts based on current levels of affordability and then also how they've changed. So this map is the result of that analysis, and it shows areas in the city that are high cost, which is the range of red, uh, moderate cost, which is everything in green, and lower cost, and this is relative to the city. Um, and then the gradient, so how dark or light the color, has to do with how quickly house prices got there, right? So in your darkest red area, those are areas that are high cost, that r r rose, the, the, sorry, the housing prices rose and appreciated very, very quickly. So house prices increased by over 20% in a few years. Um, and the lightest colors are areas where we saw declining prices between, um, since 2012. So then we combine those things together, right? We're looking for rising housing costs, and we're looking for vulnerable populations. So we combine those together to be able to understand uh, where in the city do we have this sort of alignment. Um, so this shows vulnerable communities that have some degree of displacement pressure due to rising costs. Um, and it shows that really there are lots of communities that are vulnerable that have these conditions, but that the conditions vary, right? There's some of these markets are high cost, some of them are affordable, some of them are lower cost. And those conditions are important to informing the types of policy responses that would be most effective um, at preserving affordability within that market context. So in high cost areas, uh, really we have a mix of vulnerable populations. We have high and rising house prices. And really these are the areas where we would imagine that affordability pressure is substantial and where gentrification is largely underway. Um, so from a strategy perspective, there's not a lot of things that you can really do um, to preserve affordability beyond the strategies that we have at our disposal that are really taking advantage of the existing market demand. So this is like inclusionary zoning, for example, that you're taking advantage of market demand to create new units. Um, but because you have not a lot of vacant land and you have really high costs, a lot of our most robust strategies to preserve affordability aren't, don't really work. Um, in moderate cost areas, the values are currently affordable, but in particular places, the so places near high cost markets or amenities, uh, you know, like transit improvement projects or commercial corridors or places where we have large scale development, you know, there can be heightened demand from investors in those areas 
potentially targeting higher income households. And those are places where we might be concerned that the conditions are such that we, that we could see some uh, quick shifts in house prices that could really increase displacement pressure. So currently, the sort of relative level of affordability means that we have many more options to preserve affordability before those price, in, price increases happen. And then finally, in low-cost areas, those are areas where really the values are too low to signal displacement pressure from rising costs. But in fact, these are the areas where we have the most significant displacement uh, in Chicago, and it's because of lack of investment. So these are communities where long-term disinvestment is more of the critical type of displacement. Um, but because we have some areas where we have rising costs, um, and we have lots of opportunity because costs are currently low, that we can really kind of prioritize at the same time strategies for inclusive growth um, and equitable development that are moving forward in tandem with investment. So these are um, uh, community land trust uh, models. These are thinking of ways in which we can think of um, prioritizing moderate income home ownership opportunities in areas where we see, are seeing investment so that really that neighborhood can rise up with the market. So thinking back to the 606, this inset is showing us um, the area around the 606 that we talked about as 606 West. It's actually that really that really dark red little line right on the border of Humboldt Park and, and Logan Square. Um, it's now among the highest cost areas in the city, and this, ma this map shows us that it got there really fast, uh, as we know from our separately from other analysis like our house price index. So instructively, these are areas that in we, you know when we were doing this work spent a lot of time ground truthing it. We spent a lot of time doing it at different iterations. In 2012, before the development of the 606, this area was green, so it was affordable. So that really told us and tested us that really updating this annually could give practitioners and policymakers a really critical tool to assess conditions and needs at the neighborhood level on an ongoing basis and to understand how displacement pressure is changing within a community. So we're using this study. Um, to really give neighborhood organizations on the ground the ability to uh, complement their experience by saying, Here is, here's what's happening, what we know is happening in the neighborhood, and here's a map that is illustrating those changes. So this is showing an area in Pilsen and Little Village where there's, a, there's a, been ongoing conversations about a future uh, Rails to Trails project, the El Paseo. Um, and that there's been a lot of community interest in ensuring that we preserve affordability in tandem with this investment. So this is showing current conditions within a half mile of the trail, the proposed trail. And what you can see is that the area has a mix of typologies, right? We have affordable areas, but prices are rising um, in most of them, and in some cases significantly. We have on the, to the north um, some stronger markets with really increasing up in prices. It looks a lot, honestly, like the 606 did with Logan Square, um, which is a very strong market, or um, the, the neighborhood to the east and 606 East, um, really putting pressures on, on the more affordable parts of the community. Um, and because we're updating this study annually, we're also able to help community organizations identify where in the neighborhood we're seeing rapid changes. So this is comparing last year's map with this year's map, and we this is just showing areas where we're seeing intensified pressure. So these are Census tracts where, for example, the green areas, they used to be blue. They were low-cost areas, now they're moderate-cost areas, and prices are rising rapidly. Or the red area um, is, used to be green, it used to be affordable, and now it's high cost. So this information is deployed to community organizations to be able to not only understand what conditions are on the ground, but to also complement on-the-ground knowledge. We know house prices are increasing. This map shows that they are, um, and to understand why. So in that green area, for example, close to a transit, um, it's connecting a big park system, the boulevard um, with some really good housing stock, it intersects the commercial corridor. So there's, this gives uh, folks on the ground that intelligence to be able to, one, understand, or not really understand because they know what's happening in communities, but it allows them to make that bridge to folks that are thinking of policy or to think strategically about what type of interventions might be most important um, and give them that data context to make that case. And we've also made all of this data available um, in an interactive map on our, on our website that allows people to explore high cost areas, moderate cost areas, lower cost areas, understand some of the policy recommendations, and then we have these sort of 
um, ways to explore uh, particular um, upcoming or past uh, large-scale public investment to understand the neighborhood context surrounding them. So with that, I will um, pass it over and thank you for the opportunity. Looking forward to the conversation. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Sarah, as I could give uh, presenter status to over to Sumala, there's a question. Did you look at all at changes in the homeless population as you're tracking some of these changes in neighborhoods? So we did not, um, in part because, the again, we were, this is, I guess you're, you're looking specifically around the 606 when we're kind of looking more at sort of socioeconomic and demographic changes. And, but I don't believe homelessness is part of our segmentation model, um, but I would be interested in understanding how that might change that clustering map, and I think it's a valuable thing to include. Certainly, you know, when we think about, think about vulnerability um, to displacement, particularly for very low-income people, that that is the, um, that's the implication, right, of lost affordability often is homelessness. So there's certainly a continuum for these policies and, 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 the, and the context for them is really important. Great, all right, thank you. So with that, we wanna turn it to the last case study, which is on the 11th Street Bridge Project. Many of us have heard about this effort to put some practices into place so that we can prevent and interrupt some of these pressures. And um, we're gonna hear from Somala, who's gonna talk a little bit about an interim report that they just completed, looking at how that, um, that data, what it's showing at this point. So Somala, you wanna take it away? Sure, um, and I wanna thank you again, Deanna and Renee for having me. Um, hi everyone, my name is Somala Dibby, um, and I am um, located at the Urban Institute um, and I support a team um, here at the Urban Institute um, that's part of um, the Urban Greater DC group, which again is the uh, local DC interme uh, data intermediary for the um, National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit today about um, the Bridge Park um, and kind of what our role has looked like in supporting them. Uh, I'm gonna talk somewhat about some of the early outcomes that we're seeing, but I'm really trying to focus this um, this conversation today on um, how they kind of got to this point and kind of the, the capacity that they've built to uh, to monitor neighborhood change and and even monitor their their own progress in mitigating gentrification and displacement. So um, uh, I do I strongly encourage folks um, if you want to read more about kind of the initial outcomes and what we're seeing. I'll talk a bit about that today, but there's a lot more about that in our report and the, there's a link to the report at the end, at the end of the presentation. Um, so to get started, uh, so Urban um, has been, has partnered with the 11th Street Bridge Park since about late 2015 or early 2016. Um, we support them in multiple capacities. Um, so first and foremost, we're their formative evaluator. Um, and so um, I'll say a bit about kind of what the Bridge Park does, but we, we've basically been monitoring um, their, their progress in kind of developing um, their equitable development strategy. Um, we also support them in managing um, some of the data. And I'll, again, I'll, I'll um, speak about that later on in the presentation, but we manage both their program level data and um, population level data um, about um, people who live in their neighborhood. Um, and so those are kind of two major roles that we play. We also provide um, technical assistance to them um, around continuous improvement. Um, and so we, we, we're we kind of, there's a bit blurring of the lines there, but um, you know, our hope is that uh, all the support that we give um, them is, is kind of able to enhance like their role in mitigating displacement. So a little bit about the, uh, and this is our team, um, as you can see, Michael's also supporting this work. So a little bit of cross pollination on this webinar. Um, so about the Bridge Park, um, as you all know, um, the 11th Street Bridge Park is um, does not currently exist yet, but it um, will be a park that spans um, the Anacostia River, which is a river um, here in DC. Um, and it uh, takes over kind of the, the remaining um, piers of an old um, vehicular bridge and builds, uh, it, it, it will be kind of its own elevated parkway above the river. Um, so I'm showing some renderings here about what that future park will look like. Um, I think this kind of 
you know, ties nicely to what Sarah was saying about um, kind of, you know, the need for for these uh, these infrastructure projects and public amenities projects to really think ahead and, and get in the door early. So um, a major kind of uh, component of the Bridge Park has been to um, develop this equitable development plan. And that is uh, that, that's something that they developed back in 2015. So I'll, I'll speak a little bit more that, about that in a, in a bit. But just to give you a little bit more context, um, the Bridge Park is located um, uh, kind of at the nexus of two very different parts of the city. Um, so DC is, is consistently kind of ranked uh, amongst American cities as kind of one of the highest, um, you know, gentrifying cities in the country, highest levels of inequality across all kinds of indicators. Um, and I think the Bridge Park really epitomizes um, that that dynamic. Um, so. Um, as you can see, kind of the northwestern part of this map um, shows is, I guess, considered the western part of the Bridge Park area. And, and this area is a um, kind of what the Bridge Park has defined as the scope of kind of their activities, right? Um, so this is a Bridge Park geography. It's not um, a formal DC neighborhood geography. But so the northern part is Capitol Hill, right? Um, it's Capitol Hill. It's a new area called um, Navy Yard. Um, but this is really, it, it's been kind of historically um, wealthy and it's, it's getting more so. It's, it's seen a lot of um, revitalization um, and transformation, quite frankly. Um, on the uh, bottom right side, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit more in a bit, um, is um, the Anacostia neighborhood. Um, and so it's Anacostia along with several other neighborhoods. Um, and so this part of the city um, has kind of, a, it's, historically been, um, you know, the part of the city with uh, the highest African-American population um, and so and, and also kind of the highest uh, naturally occurring affordable housing and just uh, assisted affordable housing assets. Um, but that just that's to kind of just give you a quick sense of where the bridge park kind of finds itself and what motivated its equitable development plan. Um, so um, there's just to give a bit of context about where the bridge park kind of sits now. Um, you know, DC as a city is, is constantly changing and especially now um, we're seeing um, there's a lot of projections for major population growth um, and we're approaching almost 700,000 folks now. Um, I think most uh, an important population trend that's kind of um, dictated the current context of where the bridge park, um, how the bridge park exists is um, is Anacostia itself, right? So uh, once upon a time, um, it was not a black community. Um, it was actually a white working class community. Um, and um, through kind of compounded racialized urban planning policy in the mid 20th century, um, ended up uh, kind of, you know, precipitating what people call white flight um, and then became a predominantly black community. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to switch. Uh, but even before the 20th century, um, Ward 8, which is the neighborhood um, uh, that's kind of east of the Bridge Park area, um, was very much a symbol of kind of black self-empowerment. Um, you know, Frederick Douglass settled there. Um, it was kind of the site of, um, it, it's where many of, of the first kind of free African-Americans um, uh, in the 19th century chose to settle, um, you know, really strong black civic institutions there, um, both in the past and in the present. Um, but there's a lot, uh, there, there are lots of ways that, um, you know, folks have continued to suffer in this area. So just to, again, to show you a little bit of um, the, the, the kind of disparities in the city, poverty rates in Anacostia and areas east of the Anacostia, um, you know, far kind of outstrip other parts of the city. Um, this is true. Um, you also see this around um, uh, in income, right? So folks in east of the river um, uh, ha have m trouble kind of supporting um, ex just basic expenses, right? Basic living ex expenses. Um, and we see this especially so with housing. Um, folks uh, east of the river, um, especially renters, are um, highly cost burdened compared to um, uh, other parts of the city, as well as even their neighbors directly west of the river in DC. 
Um, and the other major piece is that, I mean, I think this goes without saying, but, you know, this is part of the city's already kind of experienced a major transformation, right? I think if you had asked folks 20, 30 years ago, um, DC was really trying to attract people back to the city. Um, it's successfully done that. And um, now it's, it's that, that wave is, is starting to penetrate all parts of the city, including parts of the city that were neglected by disinvestment and, and also just isolated again by, by urban planning policy. So um, this map just shows you here um, a little bit what, what that population growth will look like. Um, and this is a bit more about kind of how much attention just kind of in, um, you know, the social imagination of people who live in D.C., how much attention Anacostia is getting. It's, it's, it's kind of the focus of, of lots of new development, um, lots of new um, very kind of glitzy development. It will be the site of the new um, uh, entertainment and sports arena for our basketball teams. Um, so just, just to put a, the bridge back in context a bit. So. Um, now I want to focus and tell you a little bit more about um, kind of the equitable development plan itself um, and, and what kind of motivates the Bridge Park um, in, in pursuing it. So the Bridge Park has this equitable development plan. They first developed it back in, um, I want to say 2015 or 2016. Um, that process involved um, launching a series of kind of task force uh, task forces and um, stakeholder groups. Um, our first report on the Bridge Park details, uh, has this in detail, kind of what their process was to actually develop their equitable development plan. So I also encourage you all to read the first report that we wrote about them. Um, but across that time, they um, brought together stakeholders across sectors, housing, small business, workforce development, um, you know, organizing community, uh, community-based organizations, service providers, um, and even government as well to kind of brainstorm collectively, um, you know, where are the policy opportunities for equitable development to become a reality in Anacostia? Um, what are the programmatic opportunities and, and how is the Bridge Park really well positioned to um, push forward a vision uh, for equitable development? So five years later um, and two plan versions later, um, they developed 14 strategies across four domains. The first one of those domains is workforce development. Um, and um, I have a, a little bit here about kind of initial outcomes, um, or not so much outcomes, just results of their um, of their program. So, um, but the the crux of the workforce development policy uh, or programs include kind of making sure that when the bridge does actually get constructed, which will happen in 2023, that um, residents in the immediate area are prioritized in the hiring um, for that um, construction. The other pieces that they're offering is um, workforce development programming and um, skill development, and then also just kind of ongoing advocacy work, um, trying to connect with other stakeholders in the city who, who are moving policy in this space. Um, they're also doing lots of small business development work. Um, so um, they're, they offer microloans to businesses in Ward 7 and 8. Those are the two wards that are east of the river. They also offer technical assistance. Um, they're tracking kind of the jobs that are created through those businesses. And they also intend to support a number of businesses on the park itself once it's constructed. Um, on the housing front, um, they have a home buyers club through which they've supported 72 folks um, in purchasing homes in, in Ward 8. And those homeowners um, are also native to Ward 8. Um, they also initiated a land trust. Um, and that is, um, you know, very much still in the early stages, but they have, um, they're pretty close to securing um, their first, um, first few properties. Um, and then they also offer ongoing tenants' rights education. And then finally, um, you know, as Michael mentioned, cultural displacement is really important too. And so they have a, a suite of strategies to kind of uh, enhance kind of social equity, right? So anything from um, building the local arts community and connecting the arts community to, to funding, to kind of serving as an information hub for any community member, to making any, the programming that eventually um, becomes available on the park available um, and affordable and accessible to longtime residents. So that's a bit about the Bridge Park and its equitable development plan. Um, we, as I said in, in our report, our reports really document, um, you know, how the plan came to fruition. And the Bridge Park is actually putting out a series of videos over the next um, month or so 
um, ex with, with explaining kind of through their own voices and through the voices of some of their service recipients um, how uh, the plan came to fruition. So strongly encourage you to, to use those resources. Um, just to kind of quickly, I guess, harken back to something that Michael talked about, you know, I, I think in, in preparing this presentation, I, I too was trying to figure out, you know, why is it important that we leverage data for these purposes, right? If, if so much of what we know is already um, kind of, you know, known through the lived experiences of the people who live in these neighborhoods and, and people who work in these neighborhoods. Um, but really, I think um, it, it, it's about accountability. And this is a value that the Bridge Park has led with um, since the beginning, right? Um, it's, it's being able to communicate that, um, you know, we, we have this equitable development plan, it's great, awesome, um, but without kind of data to kind of back it up and to communicate exactly what's been happening um, and, and to what level of impact you're having, you can't, you can't really, you, ha you don't really know um, whether or not these strategies are actually achieving um, some level of equity, right? Um, so, Mala, if I could so, do a quick time check, if you could wrap it up in about five minutes, and I'm sorry for that. Sure, yeah, I, I don't have too much more to get through. So, um, there are three kind of main ways that we um, use data to kind of help the Bridge Park um, track equitable de development outcomes. Um, so, first, we kind of help you know, manage and collect their program data, and we help them facilitate kind of a con continuous improvement process. The second piece is um, we collect lots of population level data. Um, so that includes um, kind of national level data sources, as well as, um, you know, city level and administrative data. And then the third piece is we kind of also help them do more quick turnaround, rapid fire um, research analysis um, to do, uh, that can be kind of publicized and, and weaponized. So on the program data front, um, this has really looked like, um, it's actually been, you know, going back to basics. We had to sit down with their, their team and their partners, and we led a series of workshops about basic continuous improvement principles. Um, and through those workshops, we um, developed logic models, we attached indicators and metrics um, for uh, across all of their programs, and, and we helped them uh, create, develop equitable development goals. Um, and uh, we also encourage them to set targets. So this is just a sample logic model for just one of their many strategies in housing. And again, you all have the slides so you can read through it, but I just want to um, demonstrate how we're, you know, exactly how we're getting them to think about outcomes and data. Um, the other thing is that these are tools that they constantly refer back to, right? So um, as they expand programming or change it or partner, with different folks, they return to their logic model and they actually edit it and update it. So the red is kind of where the updates are made. And then finally, these are um, uh, all the data that they are collecting to basically communicate um, those outcomes, their outputs and their outcomes. And as you can see, this kind of combines, um, you know, ACS data with um, local level um, property data and, um, and, and uh, program data. Um, so that's one one way. The second way is, um, you know, I think we are constantly trying to locate the Bridge Park and in kind of um, capital E equity and, and their progress progress and kind of achieving that. Um, I think, you know, we've really been adamant about distinguishing equitable development from equity, right? There's kind of the program level equitable development goals, and then there's kind of big picture equity. Um, and that's kind of dictated by the history of structural racism. So we're constantly bringing that history and that data to bear on um, on what they're doing with their programs, and they they actually do use this to kind of guide um, and 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 shape kind of their programming, and 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 just to reflect really broadly about um, what impact they they can expect to make. Um, and doing that, we can leverage lots of resources available in Urban Greater DC. Um, and I will kind of skip through those, um, but I do encourage you also to use um, or to, to, to look through Urban Greater DC's um, website. Um, this is another resource um, that one of our colleagues did demonstrating um, kind of what it would take to close equity gaps in the city more broadly. Um, and then finally, um, we support with kind of, um, you know, ad hoc um, data analysis. So we um, for the community land trust, for example, that's still kind of, again, in the beginning stages, but one strategy that they're thinking about tapping into is um, leveraging city-owned land. Um, and so we were able to kind of, you know, get that data, crunch it for them, and po um, push out this map. Um, I'm just going to keep on going here because I realize it's 310 and I want to leave some time for questions. 
Um, overall, um, you know, there's always limitations to our process, right? We can always use more data that we don't currently have. Um, we, we're lucky to have data agreements with city agencies and the Bridge Park has leveraged Urban specifically for that process, but not all city agencies are ready to share their data. Um, and we're also not tracking individual level displacement. That's a strong aspiration that both we at the Urban Institute and the Bridge Park have, but um, in, in not being able to do that, we're, we're kind of limited in being able to communicate our impact. Um, but we are, um, you know, using the tools that we do have, we are um, kind of pursuing additional kind of analyses in the future. So I'm gonna actually skip past that. Um, so a few kind of quick lessons. Um, we just encourage folks to whatever plan you go with, just make make it realistic. As you know, that the bridge park kind of defined a specific geographic scope um, for the for their activities, and so um, you know just because that's something that they knew that they could honor, they didn't kind of try to push their boundaries too much. Um, they also collaborate with these other service providers, and we've been working not just with the bridge park but with their partners to do all this continuous improvement and program data work. Um, I think I've already belabored this point, so I'll go ahead and pass that. Um, but really, what we've been doing with them is building their organizational capacity, right? Like, I mean, I think you, we, we leverage research at, that, um, that places like Urban and IHS do, but it's really about kind of building their capacity to kind of think in this, uh, to, you know, do their own thinking around this. Um, okay, so I am at time. I realize there's only three minutes left for questions, but um, lots of links and resources um, for you all to explore. Thank you. So just um, to clarify, uh, Somala, who is the they that you've been referencing um, in, this, in this webinar? Uh, usually when I say they, I refer to the 11th Street Bridge Park team. Okay, and that is made up of, can you say anything about the organizations? Sure, yes. Um, so uh, that is made up of, uh, Levin Street Bridge Park is one of the projects of a larger umbrella organization called Building Bridges Across the River. And they're partnered with, um, uh, they have lots of partners, but their main partners include Skyland Workforce Center, which is another Building Bridges Across the River um, project, um, WACIF, which is a CDFI located here in DC, um, City First Enterprises, which is another CDFI um, that focuses on housing, and MANA, which is a um, housing service provider here in DC. So you can learn about all those folks, um, both in our report and on their website. All right. So a couple, a few things, uh, final comments. Um, the report is in the handouts portion of this webinar room, so please grab it before we close it up. I do want to thank all of our presenters, Michael, Sarah, and Samala. We asked them to present a whole lot of work in an unrealistic amount of time. Uh, but please know that as you get a follow-up email from GoToWebinar with a recording to today's session, we will link a lot of the resources that they have referenced. Um, I, 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 want to, I, I wanted to highlight who makes up this 11th Street project, because if you're here as a government agency, you know, there's a lot of work that you can be doing to track and, and deploy some resources to collect and track data. But if you're here as an NGO, this probably feels like an insurmountable uh, goal. So I want to highlight in the previous webinar, which I linked in the, in the question box, um, we heard from Living Cully, which is a, a coalition that is advocating for both housing and open space and stormwater management. Um, and we're putting together a next webinar on this series. Um, we don't have a, a date yet. Uh, it'll be late July, early August, but we'll dig deeper into the affordable housing strategies that um, groups have deployed in coalition with, uh, with housing interests. So, if your main focus is urban water revitalization, um, what we hope you'll get out of these webinar series is some inspiration to think about who you might join efforts with locally to pursue some of these strategies to interrupt the, the displacement pressures. Um, there's a few other webinars here in front of you. Uh, we're launching next week our uh, first uh, session in our community and climate resilience theme. Uh, hearing from organizations about how they're integrating climate change education into um, their work to start uh, advocating for resilience. And then we have a number of sessions on drinking water, including one next week as well um, on infrastructure funding. 
So with that, a lot of our resources are down there at urbanwaterslearningnetwork.org. Um, both recordings to the webinar, we'll post today's recording there as well in the resources section. A lot of the reports that were referenced have already been uploaded into that resources page um, as a number of blog posts that dig more deeply into some of these case studies that we've been discussing. So uh, with that, I don't see any other questions that may have come up. Uh, do you see any, um, Renee? No, I'm not seeing any others. I think we've addressed most of them. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, with that, I want to thank everybody for joining. Please, in that web in that email, you will receive a um, link to a um, evaluation form. Please, please, please take two minutes to fill that out. Finally, uh, in a couple of weeks, we have River Rally coming up and our Urban Waters Learning Network Learning Forum. So uh, please join us. That is where we always continue these conversations about gentrification and displacement and hear from other communities about what they're doing on that front. Um, and again, if the learning network is new to you, there are my name and Maria's from Groundwork USA. Reach out, learn more about the kind of trainings that we do. We'd love to have you um, join our network. So with that, again, thank you, Michael, Sarah, Samala. Really appreciate your work and your willingness to share it with, with our network. So um, appreciate all your time today. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and close up the webinar room. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Appreciate it.